Dobar dan, pozdravljeni na tretjem dnevu in zadnjem delu festivala Indigo. Danes imam jaz to čast, da vas pozdravim pri prvem dogodku festivala Indigo, ki je nastal kot zamisel našega direktorja Blaža Pršina, ki sedi tam le donso zadnji skor vrsti in ki ga pripravljajo skupaj z Brandonom Rosenblutom in Ajdinem Bašičem. Skratka, mi smo zelo veseli, da se je festival preselil v Cukrarno. Lani smo se spraševali, ali je Cukrarno nastala za festival Indigo ali Indigo za Cukrarno. V vsakem premeru gre za krasno sinergijo. Festival Indigo prinaša vsebine, ki se jih kot ekipa v Cukrarni morda premalo dotaknemo. Zato me pa veseli, da imam danes to čas, da predstavim umetnika Olafa Nikolaja. Warm and welcome to Cukrarna, Olaf. I know you are a regular guest in Ljubljana. You know you are cycling around the town even, so you are totally local. But still, we are very happy that you are with us, that you will give us introduction. So allow me to say a few words in Slovin and then the floor is yours. Torej, verjamem, da ga poznate, pa vseeno dovoljte, da povem par stavkov. Nemški umetnik Olaf Nikola iz svoji praksi obravnava teme, ki obsegajo vse od politične in družbene kritike do preučovanja človeškega zaznavanja. Konceptualni okvir njegovih projektov vključuje tudi vprašanje, kako si umetnost in oblikovanje estetsko prilaščata naravo in jo izkoriščata. S prevajanjem različnih znanstvenih teorij v estetsko umetnostne indijome vzpostavlja nove diskurze in aktualne premisleke o vlogi umetnosti v družbi. Poleg številnih samostojnih in skupinskih razstav je med drugim leta 1997 in 2017 sodeloval na dokumenti v Kaslu, ter leta 2001 in 2005 na Beneškem Bienalu. Trenutno je profesor na Akademiji za likovno umetnost v Minhnu. The floor is yours. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you for, for joining the lecture. Also, I know it would be much nicer to sit outside with this beautiful autumn day and the sun. So, what I wanted to talk about is I present you works of mine, but not in a way that I wanted to give you an overview of my, my body of work. It is more that I was especially yesterday and uh, also before following some talks here. And I had the uh, idea, also the framework of the talk, what we, the whole festival, um, to focus on this kind of political aspect, what we are in right now. And I was looking through my works and I was very surprised sometimes to find echoes, which are more than uh, 20 years ago and they're very, as they would be today, not because of the works, just because of the constellation. So when you read about neoliberalism, you read about all these kind of things, you could have read that 25 years ago also. It's like something has not changed. It's a very strange feeling sometimes. So for example, this newspaper was published in 1999. So, and when you would read the headlines of that, it could be a newspaper of today. And at that time in 1999, they asked artists, what they would expect from the new millennium, what is coming, the year 2000, that was a great thing. So, and you could deliver certain uh, projects, and I proposed them um, this, what you see in the corner up there, which is a sticker, and enjoy the wife, the wife enjoy. So for me, that was the two things what I thought which will characterize the period to come and which I was living in enjoyment and survival. So you can try to survive the enjoyment or you can enjoy to survive. So it depends how you start to read it and how you engage with it. So this double layer of things, that was something what was especially in the 90s an experience for me. Maybe some of you know that I grew up in East Germany. So when the wall came down, there was a new system I was facing. And it was interesting to me to learn to navigate through the system, to learn how the system is working, and also to learn how options you have to navigate in the system. So one work which I did at that time is a big sneaker. It's the Air Max of Nike. Uh, this year, I think Nike did a remake of the Air Max, uh, or, or last year. At that time when I did it, it was just a simple 
what was the most uh, fancy uh, shoe you could have. So, you know. And the funny thing was, was there was this nice uh, joke by somebody. When you went to an opening and all the curators who were extremely critical and politically correct uh, were wearing Nikes and sneakers. And you could, and I think there's a nice work by Amkin and Truxet, which is just a bunch of sneakers, and it's called the curator's shoe. <laughs> so it was this kind of way, you know, that you are part of something what you also criticize. So this double layer, uh, in this work, because the sneaker has never exhibited itself, it's a blown up sculpture, you can go in, you can lay in, it's like a big sofa. And it's mostly when it's exhibited uh, playground for kids. So they love to, they can move it, they can go in, they can play with it. If you not want to play and you want to read, there's a text which surrounds this sneaker, and it's a text by Sadie Smith, which was published in the time um, around when the sneaker, when my, the Amex was coming out. And this text is a short catalog of things that you think you want. And interestingly, Sadie Smith published this text in a magazine called Face Magazine, when Face Magazine was celebrating his anniversary. And she was a regular contributor to Face Magazine, and Face Magazine is the magazine which was the most important magazine for merging art, culture, and commercial stuff in the 90s in London. Young British art, all these kind of things you could find there. And they really created a kind of lifestyle which on a superficial level than a new labor, new Britannia, and all these kind of things were catching up with and cultivated. So, and she published a text in this magazine, criticizing the magazine. And it starts, so what is that what you think you want? The received wisdom goes that you want fame, that we all want it now, the same way our parents wanted a good melon. The good news, and this is the end of the text, is, in the end, it's the new trainers you want, and don't try to tell me different. Well, the good news is, you don't only think you want them, you really want them, despite their three months lifespan, Nike's profit, and the children who make them. Because they are beautiful. Because they are art. And as we have learned these 20 years, art will you making doing shit like that nine times out of ten. So what she is talking about is how you as an artist participating exactly in that what you are criticizing. And how do you navigate in such a system? How do you deal with the aesthetic codes which are helping you to survive at the same time uh, commodifying you? And this text what is surrounding the sneaker is installed in a way that you have to read the first line and then you have to go back to read the second line. So if you want to read the text, you're circulating around this sneaker like an object which is in the center of your little universe. So this leads me to something, thinking more about the aesthetic, the question, what is aesthetic, what makes you participating, or is it something what, uh, where is the point what the whole crucial thing is about when art is doing nine times, making you doing nine times out of ten this shit? What does that mean? What is it what is organizing our feelings and what is helping us to navigate on the one time and on the other side are being commodified? And I find it quite uh, helpful to dive back into history. So if you ever go to Rome and to visit one of the most interesting private museums, the Galleria Colonna, you enter the Galleria Colonna, which is one of the few private galleries which still have the hanging like it was originally intended. So you enter in this room and then you see this huge mirror hall. On the ceiling there is the painting, the Battle of Lepanto, because one of the Colonnas was the commander of the uh, fleet who were uh, in the Battle of the Panda, what was building up the Turks. And when you work back, you see also this little place with a little column, everything like this insignia of the power. A little nice detail is the cannonball in the staircase, because during the 19th century in the revolution, somebody tried to bombard the palazzo and the cannonball just hit there and laid there. And of course they just let it there, that's just to show who is on the longer run. So you can check that. So, but if you go there, you have this hanging of the paintings. You see these three paintings 
on the left side, so they are mirrored by three paintings on the other side. And when I was there, I thought, wow, it's interesting, uh, the hanging of these paintings, because in the middle, you have on this side, where you see it not so well, you will see it now better, it's a Tintoretto, it's a Narcissus. It's the Narcissus who is just looking down to the water, seeing himself. On the other side, you have a painting which, unfortunately, I don't have a very good uh, reproduction. It's a Hieronymus Bosch, The Temptation of Sant Antonio. There's a better version of it, like this, which is in the Doria Pamphili. So, and these two paintings just hang opposite to each other. And I was asking myself, is this just by accident? And then, when you go back, the top painting and the lower painting on both sides, they are the morning, the noon, the night, and the evening. So, there's no accident. These two paintings meaning something. They are commanding each other. And what is it what is combining a Narcissus and the Temptations of Sant Antonio? So, the Temptations of Sant Antonio is about a monk living in the desert, having temptations. And his little, kind, tiny problem is, he doesn't know who is speaking to him. It's the devil or it's God? Or is it the devil who pretends to be God? So he needs a certain distinction to distinct what is a message from God, what is a message from the devil. So he's facing the same problem as Narcissus because Narcissus does not know that he is seeing himself. Somebody tells him. Before he's believing he's seeing somebody else. So what you have is a theory of images. It's about what is an image, and why do you need images? And what does an image with you? Why do you need an image? Because you need a guideline. You need something to orient. Narcissus, when he knows that he is Narcissus, he, the whole world is broken down and he is totally lost. And Antonio needs a guideline to understand who is God. He calls it believing. So. The question, what is an image, is deeply connected to the question, what we believe, and how we believe, and how images are produced, and what is how images are circulating. There's another nice image here, and this I found in a report about how to test scientifically if animals have consciousness or not. And the way is to see how they behave in front of a mirror. The concept is very simple. If you react to a mirror in a way that you will recognize something in the mirror, then it's believed that there is consciousness. So I don't say that it's true or it's not true. The interesting thing is that also in a very advanced scientific theory, you need an image theory because they say consciousness is only there where people are able to register images or somebody registers it. An animal, if it registers images, then we say it has consciousness. So it is very deeply linked to our idea who we are when we talk about images. And so that's why I think when you walk, work in this aesthetic field, you are doing at the same time not only exploring unknown territory, you're also cutting very, very old territory at the same time. It's going a back and forth thing. So um, this is now a very mental thing, but it has also physical consequences. This is a work uh, which was exhibited in the Kunsthalle in Basel. And the Kunsthalle in Basel is a building from the 19th century. It's not so beautiful, new as this building. So if, and uh, the former director there, Thomas Kern, uh, asked artists to contribute to an exhibition with the very, very um, little, not ambitious title, Welt Moral, the moral of the world. So when I visited the place, I saw that in the doors, where you see now the thresholds, there were no thresholds, but the wood had different colors. So when I asked him, used to be there thresholds, because under a threshold, the wood is aging differently because of the light. And he said, yes, but we had to remove them. And I said, why did you remove the thresholds? You know, they disturbed for installation, and also, we found them not contemporary for artworks anymore, because if you place sculptures, nobody can distinguish if this is a sculpture as well or not. So you have a certain economy of objects which are evaluating other objects. I mean. So I asked if we could replace the thresholds. So we replaced the thresholds for this exhibition. Now you can ask, what has a threshold to do with moral? The 
Latin name for threshold is limen. Elimination means to bring somebody above a threshold. It's crossing from one order to another, from life to death, from an order from there to there. That's why archaeologists, if they want to study spaces, looking for thresholds, because they mark the border between physical and metaphysical spaces. So, and the most interesting thing is, when you walk above a threshold, you do it without recognizing. You just move differently. You don't, if there is none, you move slow. If there is one, you move a little bit higher. And that was very nice illustrated because during the press conference, the director forgot to mention the piece, but he fell three times because he was stumbling about the thresholds, because he knew his place without the thresholds. So, but he did not move. And what I found interesting is you register something and you make a decision, but you don't do it consciously. Because when you move through the space and there is a threshold, you just do it. You make a decision without knowing that you did a decision. And this is the field what I call aesthetic. In this field, we just make decisions without knowing we do decisions. But we do it all the time endlessly. And this is where I like to work. This is what I like to play with. So that's why I was uh, showing you these more things. Giving this idea with the imaginary, the images, how guideline them, is a project what uh, was executed in Scotland. And I was invited to contribute with a sculpture to the national park, the first national park of Scotland, which was surprisingly uh, in the end of the 90s, being to 2000 established, before there was none. And so they invited several artists, and I think they expected more sculptures. So when I visited the place, I was just there and then asking, what are doing people here in this? I mean, hiking. And then there was a funny thing. They said, oh, they like to do barbecue, a lot of barbecue. And then I was visiting all the time. It was very rainy. And I said, it's a bit strange, you know, when it's raining all the time, how do you barbecue there? I said, oh, we have waterproof matches. I said, okay, that's interesting, waterproof matches, and you barbecue in the rain. Yes, that's what we do. So, and then I also saw that they uh, do a lot of little things like uh, taking trees down and replanting trees. What in this concept of a national park in Scotland seems to me surprising because in Germany, for example, if there's a national park, you're not allowed to touch anything. Everything should stay at this. So I asked him, what, what is, how do you make decisions about which tree you take down and which tree you plant? And they told me, yeah, looking, we want to make the landscape more looking Scottish. I asked him, what do you mean by looking more Scottish? Yeah, for example, like this. And I said, why? You know, Consuming landscape is the most important aspect of our economy. We need tourists. And they come when they see landscapes, what they like. So we design landscapes for them as they like. So I said, oh, that's good. Can I get some of the... Can I get some of the wood from the trees? What are you cutting? And can I produce waterproof matches out of this wood? And then we calculate how many people consuming these waterproof matches, and then we build, uh, replant trees according to the amount of trees which are consumed by using waterproof matches. And so we did. So I got all this wood, and then we produced, they cleaned the view to the lake because they wanted to really recreate the image what you have seen before. It is exactly this place. So, and then this was the matchbox. And then you had a matchbox, you could buy it, and on the matchbox there were also information about the project, and that was the place where the new wood gone to be planted. So, by consuming, you changed the landscape. You participated directly in it. Not in a big way, but in a small way. So, that is, was one project where I wanted to see how I can infiltrate a thing and also produce something with the means what I have, what uh, could, on the one side, making you joyful participating, and on the other side, maybe you can reflect about what you participated in. So, um, and this kind of aspect of being on both sides of the barricade, I say, all the time, you're never only on one side, so it's a little bit like quantum physics. So, it's also in one of my favorite Batman movies, where Mick Shell uh, is playing the secretary of the evil guy, and then when she finds out that is, and when she is going home, she is very lonely, and she has this very beautiful neon at her house. Hello there in the sleeping room, and then when 
the evil guy finds out that she knows a bit too much about him, he's throwing her out of the window. And then she is reanimated by the cats, and she is turning into cat woman. And then she's going home and just dressing her up new, the new outfit. And before she is leaving the room, she is just taking a bottle of beer and is smashing two letters of her nice neon, and it's now hell here. And I liked that, so I, I recreated this neon and was uh, mostly exhibited in the front door of my gallery. Hello there, hell here. Because the way how you deal with your gallery is precisely this. So, hello there, hell here. And this is also this kind of double layered thing. When I talk about images, uh, it's like it looks like you look outside, but it's also how you consume yourself. So when I got invited to an exhibition about shopping, uh, I wanted not to design objects or a shopping bag or whatever. I thought, what could it be what really makes you interesting in yourself shopping? And I found going to the hairdresser is a right, nice way uh, how you really design yourself while shopping. So you shop yourself. So I asked if he could create a hairdresser saloon where people could dye their hair for free. So what, that's what we did. We, this is the hairdresser saloon, it's called Plant. And in the window I made a little exhibition with Plant in the art world. You know, you have Maurizio Catalan, you have Francis Picabia, Douglas Gordon, Melissa Beecroft, Elizabeth Payton, Bibelotti Rist, all where Plant is coming on. So you could have also a little bit like going to the museum. But also you could really go in and get your hair dyed professional. So, and that was going on for two weeks. The only condition what I had is that I was allowed to take photographs of the people before and after. And that they gave me permission to use these photographs for my artworks. That's what I did. So, that was a former Miss Netherlands who did this whole thing. And people were really enthusiastic about it. And these were the results. i show you some of them. The nice thing is, when people left the store, they seemed to be very happy. I was very surprised how great it is to get blonde hair. It was the time also where a guy in politics was making his uh, way to the power, and he was called the Plant, the most right-wing party in the Netherlands. So, plant has also a different connotation. So, and I used this later for designing records. So, there's a band FS Car. So, I just put that on, and when they had their tour, we just printed these faces as the tour poster. So, most people expected them, the band, to be. But so, and that was also a way, you know, how you continue the way how. People are designing. Why do they go to the hairdresser and want to dye their hair? Because they have a role model they want to follow somehow. So now they are role models themselves. So it was the logic of checking things, trying to imitate things, which I wanted to continue in a certain way with my own products. Talking about images has also something when you're looking up to the stars. So the first image what humans have seen are the stars long before they had seen anything else. You see the stars. And it's the only thing what they see, they don't know what it is. You cannot touch it. You cannot go behind. You just see it. It's coming and it's going. So all the theories about stars, when you really read about these theories, they give you everything about what you need to know about art theory. All the theories what the stars can be are the semiotic theories which you find later. Very elaborate. So. When I got an invitation to the Venice Biennial, I thought about what can I do there? What really is also using this whole constellation of an exhibition like the Venice Biennial. And the most interesting thing in the Venice Biennial used to be socializing. When people go there, they try to meet. So it's a market of economy of attention. You need attention, you need to meet somebody, you need to hang out with somebody. The most difficult thing is to get a place for dinner 
So everybody is booking dinner like two months in advance. So, and that is the whole thing. So I would like to work with this attention. I would like to work with this economy of attention. So my proposal was just to produce a poster where on the one side you have the stars, and on the other side you have a text. Welcome to the Tears of St. Lawrence. It's an inst instruction, if you follow it, you will see a falling star. If the sky is clear and you do it in this period of time, you will see a falling star. It is a very simple thing. I advertise the Tears of St. Lawrence, the La Notte di San Lorenzo. So the Venice Bayani did that. They posted all over the place. And so uh, people started stargazing to look for falling stars. So they invited me to that. And then two collectors came to me and said, listen, how did you do that, that the NASA is doing this for you? And the interesting thing is that when you smile about that, it sounds like they are stupid, but they are not stupid because what they really articulate very clearly, if something comes to the realm of attention, it's a commodity immediately, then you can sell it. Only when you get something what has an attention, you can sell it. What you not pay attention to, you will never can sell. So the thing is when we perceive something, seeing is immediately commodifying. So stargazing is a big thing and you gather together and you can build a nice economy around it, service economy. So, and that is something what this piece came with. And then we published a little booklet where you could read about everything what has to do with the stars and also a glossary where you have about falling stars, comets, whatever what is there. One of my favorite, so it looks like that. And that was for free at the biennial, what you could. And then also what a nice thing is, you don't need to travel to see this work. Yeah, you can just look up the city where you live and then it tells you at what time is the best condition to see it and whenever you can watch it wherever you, in the northern hemisphere where you are. So it is not, it's only time based, it's not located in this way. So and then you have, and this map is a really nice map. It's a map from the NASA, it's called the map of non-cooperative objects. It's the trash what is surrounding Earth. Because these objects are not cooperating. You cannot guide them, you cannot do anything with them. And this is one of the most uh, treasurable things, having an accurate map of these trash. Because if you went send up a satellite, you should know that it's not hitting another one, which is trash only. And some of the falling stars are something, nothing else than trash which is falling down. Also one nice episode is with, we believe that the falling stars have to do with wishes. The old Egyptians believed that when a star is falling down, somebody is dying because they believed that all the human beings are represented as stars in the sky. So if a star is going, somebody is dying. If a star is coming, somebody is born. So you see there's also a lot of things. And the wish thing comes because the old Greeks had this idea that the gods are sometimes cleaning their house. And when they're cleaning their house, the trash they throw out of the door is that thing what comes down as a falling star. But if the door is open, you can send up a wish. So you can get through the door. So these are these kind of fairy tales what you find in this little booklet. And another way how you can use images and um, playing double layer with reality, I like old postcards. And I like to go to Naples. So one of the postcards I found in Naples is this one. It's in the front of the Palazzo of the uh, the Royal Palazzo, and it's from the early 70s, and it used to be a parking lot. Today it's a pedestrian area, and at the time uh, there, the museum had sculptures. They, in the winter time, they asked artists for producing sculptures. And they had asked me, but then there was a kind of election, and then the stuff got cancelled, and then they told me, listen, we don't have any money to make a piece anymore there. And I said, I don't need any money, I just need 100 euros. I can make a piece myself. I said, how? So what I did, I reproduced this postcard and on the back I wrote this. And then I went through the city and deposited it behind all the cars I could find. And then I published also in a newspaper this one. One and a half months later a friend called me up and said, I mean you should check the internet. 
And then I saw this. So the taxi drivers made a strike and imitated this image. And in the city council, they were highlighting my project. There is a German artist who wants to create a parking lot there. So we have to really do something against that. So uh, I don't know exactly if they really imitated my image, but it was a very nice coincidence. So I was uh, just thanking them that they supported the logic of the project somehow. So, and that was one of the most successful public artworks I did, so in my point of view. So because you just play with that what is there and you can animate it in a very funny way. By um, using publications uh, for artworks, one example what I really like is a very tiny thing. It's this one here, La Boule de Voyant. And it's an announcement for an exhibition. It's called an exhibition, a narration performed in 10 episodes. So for each of the episodes which is performed, you have a kind of like a little poster, which is with a certain typo, and then you have an image of it on the backside. So all these little elements, what you need to characterize the atmosphere of this episode. You have a title, you have color, you want things. And you have these 10, and then you have 10 places and time where the episodes are happening. So these are 10 places around the world, and they are um, at several times. So you could travel around the world and see all the 10 episodes. The interesting thing was that nobody knows if there where you go, the people are participating in the episodes or not. So the first episode was also in Venice, so a TV went to the store, and they asked them, well, are you playing this episode here now? And they were quite smart, they said, maybe. So we never released if we have contacted these people, if we were in contact with them or not. So it's just going there, you see what is maybe going on anyhow, or is performed. You cannot find out. It's what you believe, what you see. And then you can deal with that. So, and that was a very simple way of doing a little exhibition, which was, I found, not too bad. One of the last things I want to show you is um, the contribution what I had for the pavilion, the German pavilion, the Venice Biennial. So, what I did, I asked people to stay on the roof of the pavilion and they produced boomerangs there. And from time to time you could see them throwing the boomerangs. And these boomerangs were sold in the city as an addition, but they were sold by people who did not know that this is art. They sold them as boomerangs. So the thing is that if you see it or not see it, it was just by accident. Nobody knew how the people came up to the roof. They were living there for seven months, and they were producing these things there. And then in the evening they went down, and in the morning they went up, but nobody had a chance to, to check that. And for me, the interesting thing was, again, these little tiny gestures which are changing what you see, what it is. It can be something else, it can be something different. So, what you call fiction in a certain way. And I want to show you, at the end, a 12-minute film, which is a kind of documentary and it plays exactly with this fiction thing as well. And uh, I need to tell the technicians, I want not to show the first movie, I want to show the second movie. Yeah. So, and that is what we're doing now. And there's still time for it? Okay, good.
Rodakis was born in Mesa Gross on the island of Egina around 1816. As a child, he only knew the small towns of the island and the city of Piraeus. His mother occasionally took him along when she went there. He grew up without his father, who was away at sea and only rarely visited the island. From time to time, his father sent considerable sums of money, enough for Adarkis and his mother to live comfortably and also to buy some land. His youth was rather solitary. His younger sister died shortly after birth. It is not known whether he was named Alexis after his father or another close relative. His mother did not send Rodakis to school, but instead hired a private tutor who instructed him in elementary subjects and also taught him to draw. The lessons came to an end after only four years and Rodakis did not receive any further education. At the age of 15, Rodakis decided to build a house of his own. He had gone to Piraeus, where he wanted to sign on a ship. Although he gave up this plan after only a few days, he did not return until several months later. He then informed his mother that he would not move back into her home. He said nothing further about his unexpected return, nor did he mention a reason for his decision to build. The secluded location was surprising, as his family also owned other plots. It was assumed that his choice was connected to the news of his father's death that reached him around this time. But in fact, he had decided in favour of this location several months before he heard this. He had clearly already spent some time planning the house, as he issued precise instructions to the hired helpers and did not use drawn plans. After only one year, a house with a large interior room and fireplace was completed. Shortly after completing the first large building, he planted a spacious garden and added extensions to the house. Even though he never spoke about it, it seemed clear that he was not building all of this only for himself. During this time, he was often seen visiting a family who lived nearby, with whom he had previously had no contact. Rudakis didn't only use local building materials from the surrounding quarries, which was unusual. He also had stone delivered from the mainland that he then processed himself. He left the facades of the house unplastered and painted the interior walls with abstract and floral patterns in strong colours. People particularly noticed the distinctive design of the many fireplaces. 
When asked about this, Rodakis only replied that he loved fire and that these were special places for him. He answered questions about his inspiration or models by saying that he wasn't interested in books with pictures, but instead preferred reading poetry. During work on the building that became known as the Dovecote, Rodakis changed. He resolved upon speaking only a minimum. His visits to his neighbours also became rarer. The neighbour's oldest daughter left Mesagross a while later and went to Piraeus, where she is said to have married. After the construction of the terrace, the extension of the garden to the east was suspended. Instead, fig trees and agaves were planted. Rodakis began to go for more and more walks at night. He released the workers, and only the son of a neighbour continued to help him in the garden. During this time, he carved the inscription into a wall of the wine store that remained unnoticed for a long time. It will be better for a man to be a cold stone than to lose all wisdom and moderation. By now, the peculiar design of the house was attracting some visitors. Interest increased when Rodakis started making sculptures to decorate the building. Some of his acquaintances claimed to recognize portraits of neighbors in the two sculpted male heads on the outside walls and in a female bust. There were also two doves, a pig, a column with a snake, a jug, a seagull, and a disc for a sundial. He stopped after he had made these 11 sculptures. One of his frequent visitors offered Rodakis to exhibit his sculptures in Piraeus. Surprisingly, he accepted. People who came to the exhibition remembered Rodakis as a friendly and talkative man, but he decided after just a week to return home with his sculptures. When he was around 50, Rodakis talked to his neighbour, whose son helped in the garden, about important arrangements for a longer absence. At first, he continued his reclusive life, but then a year later he failed to return from one of his regular visits to Piraeus. The neighbour's son moved into and took over the running of the house. Some people maintain that Rodakis committed suicide after his arrival in Piraeus. No indication of his sudden disappearance can be found in later records about the house. The property was still visited by interested persons, who assumed that the inhabitants were Radakis himself or members of his family.
so much, Olaf, for your lecture. I, I'm, I believe that we enjoyed it uh, and not surviving it. It, it, it. It's not a question. But is there a question from the public? Would somebody like to ask something? Mm -hmm. Um, hello, Olaf. I know that because we are involved a little bit, you do one project with uh, Luca Lupinto, you will do it in November in Plechnik House. I mean, still, it's not the opening, 8th of November, but maybe you can tell us just small, small affection of this. I mean, as you have seen, the movie what I have shown you has to do also with this attitude, how you deal with constellations of architecture where you have a lot of information, because this house, what I was documenting there, in Greece has a certain fame. Everybody who is studying ar architecture knows this house. It's uh, also Le Corbusier, Siegfried Gideon visited this house, and uh, they were coining it as the avant-garde before the avant-garde, a house which is modern before modernism. But nobody knows anything about the house. So it was a dealing with this that I introduced also a medium to the whole thing. And in a similar way, I like to deal with such constellations as the house of Plechnik. So it will be not an exhibition in the sense that you have pieces there where you identify art pieces. I like that the objects which are there already, they have a kind of dialogue with each other. And you can listen to this dialogue. Sometimes the guides are telling you something, but if you carefully see and look, you see a lot of interesting things for yourself. You'll see stories. And we want uh, to introduce objects, sounds, whispering, things like recipes, so whatever, what to cook, uh, that there's a different kind of dialogue in the house. And we started to invent a person which is partly semi-fictional, the housekeeper, and the housekeeper is more or less curating the show, uh, telling what she would maybe do different when she would be allowed to do something. So and that is a proposal to read a situation differently. And that is uh, the attitude which uh, we have for this project at Ritz Opens on November 8. And, yeah, and we also play with the idea that you get guided tours so some of the things will only be told, and you just have to remember them. There's nothing what is written down or what you can take with you about that. So. Any more questions or comments? Um, I, uh, uh, about this thing you were mentioning about the trust uh, in art between let's say, the image maker and the image watcher, the, the, the artist and the public, and this trust that is kind of established between. I'm just kind of interested because in, in, in your practice, but also like general art, there's also a lot of myth making. There's also like certain white lies and stuff. And there's also like a certain mysticism about art. So I'm just interested in like, how do you kind of square these things? Like these, like let's say myth made, making on one side and then this trust that has to be kind of established between the artist and the public. I mean, this was exactly the question with the myths about this house, you know, how could you deal with them? Interestingly, this medium were reporting about a lot of things which you find in the literature about the house. I don't know if she really prepared herself so well that she would read it, but it took me two years to collect all these informations. And uh, the myths are already there. For example, one of the most famous architects, uh, Dimitris Pikionis, who designed also the first modern Greek building, a school, but he also designed the Acropolis, the whole park of the Acropolis. He had a house close to it, and people on the island believed that he had built the house. But he changed his whole architectural style after he got to know the house in the 20s. So there's a lot of these kind of things. So how do you deal with that? You can make a very classical report, you can make a scientific thing, whatever. And I thought the best way of to deal with mythology is to use mythology. Mysticism beats mysticism. So that was the way out of this, you know? Because when you read it, you understand at the end what is true, what is not true, needs different categories than just that what you have at hand.
Actually, it's more like a, um, a comment than a question. How, how I sort of understand, but it's not about understanding, it's kind of more like a perception or a feeling about the work you presented today. It's a kind of, um, it's connected to tacit knowledge or implicit knowledge. So something kind of like a knowledge which is all around, you know, which actually it's gained uh, through kind of like personal or non-personal skills and experience, kind of like an experience, experiential knowledge, you know. And what I find it like really fascinating, it's actually that you make this knowledge uh, communicate. You, you make us, you know, understand or actually you, you, may, you communicate with that knowledge, you know. So the knowledge which is actually very difficult to communicate, you more difficult, basically it's not even expected to be communicated, you communicate that. End of comment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, if you think so. <laughs> you will not comment on a comment? No. Uh, okay. So uh, we have to wrap it up because we have another talk in like five minutes. Thank you to everybody for coming, and I hope to see you 8th of November, Blush, in uh, the opening in Plechnik House. Yes, I hope who uh, can come, should come. So but thank you once again, and okay. see you soon. Thank you.